Good evening from Singapore. My name is Camilla Hewitson and I work with C-Focus, which is delighted to be bringing you this talk series curated by our partner, Art Asia Pacific, as part of our C-Spotlight program. Thank you for joining us today. C-Focus is the anchor event of Singapore Art Week and is in its fourth edition. We are delighted to be showcasing over 170 artworks from 50 artists and 24 galleries. The platform is open to the public until this Sunday, the 23rd of January at Tang John District Park and tickets are on sale for $10 for multiple entries. As well as our talks and tours, I wanted to highlight that this year there is a specially curated fringe program at Projector X at Riverside Point, which is screening over 20 compelling artists made films. This opens this evening and runs until the 21st. But all information on these exciting events can be found at our website, cfocus.sg. And it le just leaves me to thank the speakers for joining us this evening and to hand over to our moderator, Chloe from Art Asia Pacific. Chloe. Thank you, Camilla, and welcome everyone to Pivot to the Future, Selling Art in a Virtual World. During tonight's panel, we'll be hearing from industry experts who will be sharing their experiences and insights into selling and buying art online. I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that with travel restrictions and lockdowns since the start of the pandemic, online art sales have skyrocketed. In fact, according to the Art Basel and UBS Art Market Report for 2021, art and antique transactions across the digital platforms of galleries, auction houses, and dealerships reached a record high of 12.4 billion in 2020. That is double in value from 2019. This was also the first time the share of e-commerce in the art market has exceeded that of general retail. And with NFTs taking center stage in 2021, online art sales have only grown since. But within this booming virtual marketplace, what are the new best practices for buyers and sellers alike? What strategies have galleries adopted to facil facilitate meaningful, albeit remote engagements with artworks? How do digital sales in initiatives change the scale and geographical range of a gallery's audience? And how might the virtual marketplace affect governance over art sales? Joining me in discussing these topics and more is East Lorenzo, the founder and co-director of Civil Lens Gallery in Manila since 2004. At the gallery, Issa takes the lead role in artist management, sales, gallery programming, including special projects and fairs. She has been instrumental in establishing and maintaining the professional structure of the gallery, as well as its international networks. Our second speaker is Christiana Ian Kimba Boyle, the global director of online sales at Pace Gallery, where she spearheads all of the gallery's digital initiatives, including the recently launched custom built platform dedicated to NFTs called Pace Verso. And last but not least is Yayoi Shionor Iri, a specialist on art law and the executive director of the estate of Chris Burden and the studio of Nancy Rubens. Outside of these roles, Yayoi also contributes to the Japanese firm City Lights Law, Start Bond, and art technology company focused on the reliability of transactions in the art ecosystem and collection, a digital collectibles platform. So thank you, Isla, Christiana, and Yayoi for joining me. Um, before we start, I'd like to remind the audience that there is a Q&A box and you are welcome to pop in any questions um, at any point during the session and we'll address these towards the end of the conversation. So I thought we could start our conversation um, hearing about the gallery's digital strategies. Um, so to kick things off, Issa, could you tell us about Silver Lens's strategies and approach when it comes to digital sales and some of the results you have observed so far. So good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chloe. Hello, Yayoi. Hello, Christiana. Uh, thank you for having me on the panel. Uh, this is wonderful to share with such a such a geographically um, diverse group because um, I'm in Manila, Chloe are in Hong Kong, and I believe Yayoi and Christiana are both in New York. So um, just to start off, um, Silver Lens is the gallery I founded in 2004. We started out as a photography gallery, but realized early on that Asia is very much wary of the reproducible image. So nobody wanted to buy editions. 
um, and we we quickly spread our grew our umbrella to cover everyone under the contemporary art um, umbrella. So when the pandemic hit, um, there were two things that we did. The first one was uh, we grew our media team by 200%. Um, we knew early on that the only way this was going to, we were going to move through this was to use all our online um, assets, online platforms. So my partner in the gallery, my co-director, her name is Rachel Rillo. She's the one who really grew the media team. And the media team's job was to become an ad agency for all our artists. Um, for the gallery. So we produced a lot of content in collaboration with the artists. Um, and this was really just to keep everyone in touch with what we were doing and what our artists were doing. The second thing we did was um, the, the team that takes care of clients, collectors, uh, patrons, friends, um, their job was to reach out to our clients, to our existing clients, um, and to tell them, hey, we're still here. This is what we're going to do. And the third thing we did was we we really made it made um, all the necessary uh, everything necessary to, to make sure that our artists and our staff were going to survive this. Um, because of my training, I'm a medical doctor by profession. Well, by training, not by profession. I'm a gallerist by profession, but by training, I knew that this pandemic, if indeed it was a pandemic, this was not going to be a three month, six month, nine month situation. So, um, we, and, and, and in fact, I actually pivoted and I, I put on my doctor's hat again um, for about nine months of the, of the pandemic. But so those are the three things that we did. Now, what were the effects? Um, uh, by marketing, when you say marketing the works virtually, um, we didn't try to mimic the on-site experience because the online experience there's no way the online experience can mimic or make real the on-site. So what we did was we turned everything into insider access. Okay, so this was sort of our um, overriding mission, wherein we wanted to bring our audiences into the back of the house, show them the artist studios, have them meet the artists, um, show how things are done. And it was really, it was really rewarding um, because all it did was it got people really excited. And when they finally did, uh, when we, they were finally able to come into the gallery, they did. Um, and our numbers in terms of our, you know, how we did uh, for 2020, uh, moving into half of 2021, uh, we saw 30% growth in new clients, new collectors. And 30% um, of our entire sales for the year was online from zero, from zero. So it was pretty incredible. Um, it was pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean, it's really apparent just from the website of Silver Lens, the amount of care that has gone into the materials that people can access to learn about artists. Um, I'm curious how the experience compares with yours, Christiana. Could you tell us about Case's approach and some Absolutely. of the results you've seen? Absolutely. Uh, I first off just want to say hello to everyone and good evening and thank you so much for having me see focus. Um, I would say uh, our online initiatives um, began actually before the pandemic, but definitely ramped up and galvanized once the pandemic hit. Um, it was all hands on deck, uh, I would say, going from March 2021, or I'm sorry, March 2020 and forward. Um, I was hired actually in May of 2021 to more so formalize the department um, and iron out more initiatives in terms of really developing a direct focus and also um, pushing for more programming with um, uh, online. But specifically, um, our initiatives for online actually are in interdepartmental. It, 
um, involves our marketing team, it involves our photography team, um, our sales team, our dealer team is also also plays a huge hand, as you can imagine, um, as well in terms of supporting online. Um, the way that we look at, at, lawn, uh, at online, I think that Pace has always had this vision and also um, um, this investment uh, in terms of supporting uh, artists who in some way could be categorized as being advanced studio practice artists. Um, and we've always had a tremendous tech focus. We were one of the first galleries to develop a space in Palo Alto. So um, the programming that we put online specifically, we've always thought of it to be supplemental to our in-person programming. Of course, during the pandemic, we had all of our uh, exhibitions that were supposed to be within the space online. But now that we're actually back within the gallery, very similar to what you uh, said while she was speaking, um, we wanted to make sure that we're developing programming in which our collectors feel that there's some form of enrichment that they wouldn't be able to experience within the actual gallery space. So whether that mean letting collectors know about works that uh, potentially wouldn't be able to make like an actual exhibition or opening um, the floor to, to have having writers um, write about an artist's work in which, you know, you wouldn't actually be able to see a piece like that within a physical exhibition. Um, focusing on a particular body of work that an artist may, uh, has created that we found in studio that hasn't really been exposed to the public. These are things that we find a lot of collectors love to engage with um, and also really are excited to interact with because they know that they're having this sort of insider experience. Um, as we've been able to incorporate uh, these practices, it's been quite amazing to see the growth um, in terms of our sales and how much of our sales are yielded from online specifically. Um, quite literally, I look at online now as its own venue and sort of as its own gallery, which is quite interesting. Um, also with the development of Pace Verso, which is now our Web3 platform, which we launched in November. Now we're entering a new um, part of the internet, specifically Web3 in terms of launching NFTs. Um, now that's another um, venue or website that we're now utilizing to also support a lot of our um, advanced studio practice artists as well. Um, and I mean, that uh, venture has been incredibly successful as well. We've launched with uh, Studio Drift, uh, Lucas Morris, um, and Glenn Kino. And Glenn Kino is actually an artist that we recently just started working with. But all of all of those artists have practices in which um, the venue of online actually really speaks very very well to the work that they create. Um, so it's been um, a, a bit of a pivot, but it's a pivot in which. Um, is really, really rooted in the ethos of the gallery and also has been extremely lucrative. Yeah, I think um, from what I heard from Isla and you as well, Christiana, this idea of insider access is really something that is important. Um, and presumably part of that is also the sense of intimacy of building you know, relationships over the um, internet. Um, but I'm curious, um, and also Isla, you, you said there was a 30% increase in your audience. So I'm curious about the kind of geographical breakdown and how effective these digital platforms are at connecting maybe artists and buyers from different um, cultural backgrounds um, and how important it is in terms of um, targeting specific geographical audiences or having a national or regional focus when it comes to selling artworks online? Um, that's a really, that's, that, that's a question that we also don't know the answer to. Um, we really try and just be very clear about who we are our identity as a gallery, our programming, our authenticity, our um, commitment to our artists, uh, many of whom we've we've been working with for the last 15 years, um, ever since I put up the gallery. Um, so we start with what we know, right? And um, and we build bridges from this. 
So if the bridges lead to, you know, our neighbors, our national neighbors, or, you know, further off, um, people find us. And um, we're, when we don't really enter into a geographical, it's not like we're gonna move into the, I don't know, South Asian space and try to market there. Um, we don't work that way because we feel that uh, we come from a very, very underrepresented area. Um, I mean, Southeast Asia or the Asia Pacific, is uh it's a huge population but with very very little um you know the general art world knows very very little about who we are and what you know what what we do what our art looks like so um if our goal is to be the first stop when people want to find out what's going on in southeast asia so um again we're really about broadening the conversation we're not trying to steal anyone's thunder or take anything away from anybody we're just sort of here and this is who we are this is what we do if you want to know about southeast asia look no further and then we can open doors yeah so i noticed with silver lens's presentation with c focus for example you have um, a range of artists from across Southeast Asia. You have Thai artists, Mijayin, you have Malaysian artists, Yi Lan, you have Filipino artists. Um, but with the online viewing rooms that are on Silver Lens's own website, those presentations tend to be much more focused. So at most two artists, or usually a single artist. So is that a difference um, in the kind yes. of platform? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I don't, with us, our online viewing rooms, um, we have, we hold shows on them to keep our clients and collectors. Um, we're not looking to find new clients and collectors on the OV, on our personal OVR. We rely on the Art Basel OVR, the C Focus OVR, the other, the sort of big art fair OVRs, and also third, third, um, I mean, online third party um, to grow our audience. So that it's completely separate because the Philippines is a very insulated, very local audience. So we we sort of have to wear several hats. This big hat where we keep people happy at home and this other hat wherein we're telling the whole world about who we are. So that's 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 a very, very astute um, observation, Chloe. And Christiana, what have you be, what have in your experiences with non-North American audiences engaging with PACE's digital platforms? Yeah, I should say that PACE, um, we, we're a very global space. We have spaces in London, um, Geneva, we have a space in um, Korea, as well as in Hong Kong. Um, and I would really say an issue before we really ramped up our support of online uh specifically was how insular those spaces could become but now with online programming we have this opportunity to really engage um with these multiple spaces especially in terms of supporting the programming that's going there by having some form of supp supplemental programming online specifically um and i find that there's a lot of engagement specifically from those audiences um in terms of you know inquiring about artworks or just wanting to be kept apprised of um artists that are showing within those spaces of course you know within our Hong Kong space specifically, we have a couple of Chinese artists that are specifically supported by um, our Hong Kong gallery. So it's been very, very nice to use online as a way to have New York dealers, um, American collectors specifically become very interested in, you know, artists uh, within our, our Asia programming that we wouldn't typically have that, that form of crossover. Um, so I've found that online has been very, very, very in enriching for that. Um, and just, you know, having an opportunity for collectors abroad to really feel um, uh, seen and supported in some form and uh, catered to 
which is really, really important, especially when, you know, you have a flagship space um, that can some, sometimes seem like, you know, that's the only space in which there's full support going to it. <laughs> um, and the other spaces sort of, you know, even though that's not the case, sometimes it can seem like the other spaces are more so just offshoots. So it's really provided some form of centrality to our program while uh, being able to unite our collector base as well. Thank you. And Ioi, coming to you, in terms of issues of access, what are your thoughts from a buyer perspective? Yeah, and thanks so much, Chloe and Art Asia Pacific for having me today. And super honored again to be in conversation with Isa, or shall we say Dr. Isa, uh, in her second hat, and Christiana. Um, in some ways, I think this is a very meta conversation. In our third year of the pandemic, here we still are um, in some ways having to be on digital Zoom, but because of these technologies and because of the tools that we have, we do have the opportunity uh, to be in conversation in this kind of a way. I have very fond memories of last being in region in the late 2010s. And I see, for example, like Emmy from SDPI has already written in a kind comment to some of the panelists. You know, so it's nice to feel that kind of connectivity, even though we can't really be together in real life. And so we've heard some incredible um, strategies that Issa and Christiana have continued with their galleries to pave the way for innovative digital online selling. Now I wanna focus a little bit on some of the buyer side issues, including legal issues regarding the digital looking, learning, and potentially buying of physical and digital art, right? Regarding issues of access, I think both Christiana and Issa have already mentioned this, having the opportunity to view art online, whether in OVRs, virtual museum spaces, in Decentraland, which is now Web3, through VR, maybe also through AR. These tools have really expanded the number of people that can potentially experience artwork. Right? And through these various ways, we're really hoping that these technological innovations can provide more people with the ability to look and learn just not just more people in terms of the buyer side, but the ability to look outside, outside of their local regions and also potentially purchase. And of course, as everyone has mentioned, the pandemic has just accelerated that digital transformation. Chloe had a couple of data points. I wanted to share some of my own too, which sort of go towards the same thing. The Hiscox Online Art Trade Report in 2021 noted that online sales accounted for 15.8% of all art sales, up from 7.5% in 2019, with sales in the first half of 2021 up by 72% to now $6.8 US billion. And in some ways, Issa's um, data point about how much she has been able to sell in her gallery, I think reflects that also. And so this technology is here to stay and I also think Web3 specifically is going to be about how that viewing experience augments or adds to our love of seeing art and collecting art. And also ensures, I think, and this I think for me is specifically an important point, that some of the structural barriers that in some ways kept people away from trying to see art or away from being in the art world that these structural barriers can potentially be removed. But of course, the flip side of this equation is to see how these digital tools can help approximate or add to the experience of seeing and feeling art in real life, right? Whether it's the energy felt in seeing brushstrokes and paintings, the feeling of scale you feel in relation to a sculpture or otherwise. Back to you, Chloe. I'm curious to hear more about the infrastructures that support um, digital art sales um, and also, you know, to make the use of your legal knowledge. I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about 
body, the bodies of law that are applied when sales are online or international? How does this change things? Yeah, thanks for that. And as the law, it goes without saying that the law in whatever jurisdiction always trails what's happening in real life. And so what this means in practicality is that the lived experience of buyers digitally purchasing art in cross-border transactions may not be as clear cut as the law wants the situation to be. So if you're buying from a platform that has terms of service or conditions of sale, the law that the platform wants to apply will be in a section called governing law. And hopefully that governing law will be something that allows for commercial business terms to be worked out between parties in writing. So I think a topic that everyone has hinted at is this relationship between the online and offline realms. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that I presume is a concern, um, particularly for artists who work with paintings and sculptures, is this translation onto a digital sphere. Um, and conversely, also, I wonder about the display of digital artworks in a physical space. Um, and how that works out. Um, so Christiana, I know that to coincide with the launch of Pays Verso, Pays had a showcase at Art Basel Miami where there were two NFTs on offer. So how does one go about presenting digital artworks in a physical space? Yep, so um, I mean, we, in the choice to display those two works, we wanted to make sure that we were displaying artworks that were, um, had some form of audience engagement and had a natural translation to an in-person experience um, that would be augmented reality. So with uh, the Drift and Don Diablo NFT that we debuted at our Basel Miami, um, there was a quote unquote physical part of the work, which was essentially this augmented reality installation um, that uh, people could, uh, visitors within the booth could interact with, use an iPad and move around the space and view the piece um, in concert with the actual digital work, which was um, uh, a CGI rendering of the block universe, which was created by Drift. Um, and then there was also a hologram that we had on the booth as well, um, specifically uh, to display one of the batons that uh, Glenn Kino had created for um, a PFP NFT project that was launched called Past Baton by Glenn Kino. Um, so we didn't want it to just be a situation in which we were um, uh, just trying to recreate the digital experience in IRL. We wanted it to be, you know, an enriching experience in which it made complete sense. Um, and these are two technologies that essentially were created to live within like, uh, the in-person experience uh, uh, and for people to be able to interact with. So um, those were two perfect opportunities in which we could actually show, you know, this is when digital art can actually come to life. And it's not just, you know, us redisplaying a video or a digital image on a screen. And coming back to you, Yoyoi, in your many roles. Um, so you serve as the executive director to the estate of Chris Burden and the studio of Nancy Rubens, so both non-digital artists. Um, does your role entail overseeing the digital distribution of these artists' works and how does that affect um, legal governance? Yeah, thanks for that. So in my main day job, I have the honor of working at 1717 Studio, which represents the Chris Burden estate and the Nancy Rubin studio in real life in Topanga, California. And so I work with the legacy of an artist, Burden, who prioritized looking in the flesh. For example, at his very intimate performances or even his site-specific sculptures. And I also work with living artist, Nancy Rubens, a contemporary artist who pushes the boundaries of what sculpture is or could be. But again, meant to look, experience, and feel in the flesh. Why do I keep saying this? It's because while there are some amazing things about Web3 and the internet, in some ways, I still do represent the stodgy traditional 
voice, namely that the true magic of viewing a piece of art needs to be done in real life, at least with respect to physical art. And I think Christiana and Iso will also agree with me and Chloe too, given that we all work in the art world about physical art. But one of the ways that contemporary society consumes images is through the digital realm. That's not going away. So part of working with an artist of an estate uh, and a studio of a living artist is to think about how to both disseminate images digitally to increase awareness of these artists' body of work and allow potentially for new audiences to look and engage with these artists' practices, but also to maintain some amount of control over how these images are used. Copyright is an asset that most artists in most jurisdictions have, both as a tool to protect their intellectual property, but artists, certain artists can also use it to monetize what they have created. So at least for the Burden Estate, we have an active licensing scheme. For commercial purposes that are unrelated to burden, we do charge fees and based on different types of use, we charge different fees. For example, one of burden's most well-known works in the public's eye is a site-specific installation called Urban Light created in 2008, which is a large work in a public space at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. And it's so well known that it's in some ways become a landmark of LA. And so because of this, we often get filming location requests or photography requests by commercial entities to shoot in or near urban light. And based on length of exposure, amount of the sculpture featured and the length of proposed time and period of use, we have differing rates. So Isla and Christian, I, I wonder if you've heard from any of your gallery's artists about similar concerns in terms of copyright or the way that their works are presented and translated online. Could you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. I think also specifically in terms of conversations about our Web3 engagement and specifically minting NFTs, um, which I should also preface by saying that we only um, want to make sure that when we're pushing forward in terms of working on these projects that our artists are coming to us first. Um, Pace Verso is more so a resource to our artists um, and not the other way around. So we're more so in uh, supporting their vision, but there have definitely been uh, conversations around copyright, um, uh, how their work can potentially uh, translate within the digital space. Um, I mean, also just thinking about online programming um, we've also uh, run into this situation with a couple of our artists in terms of uh, the way in which their work is discussed within a digital space or within online, um, the way in which it's presented, uh, timing of presentation. Um, so, I mean, you know, you kind of run into some of the uh, similar situations that you'd run into in terms of a physical presentation, but it's um, still very, very nuanced. Uh, and we're very, very uh, sensitive to it. And especially in terms of pivoting back to what I was saying with Pace Verso, um, operating within Web3 in a space that is constantly changing <laughs> so quickly. Um, we actually have uh, a person within our legal department um, who specifically specializes um, in copyright and also um, uh, uh, supporting media law. So um, <laughs> uh, we're very, very um, sensitive to this point and always wanna make sure that we're sort of a step ahead in terms of um, having these conversations with our artists. And Isa? Uh, I think the question with the artists and how their works, I mean, we don't, we come from a gallery system that's a very, very, I mean, our artists are working with the communities. We are very much on the ground, from the ground up. Um, our artists who work in digital media, they're, they've, they've been native to digital media 
pre-pandemic and pre-NFT. So this is really the world that they, they make work in. Um, I think that moving into this new, you know, the, the new the Web3 or the new systems that keep changing, as Christiana said, um, I think they are keeping tabs on it, but they're not, it's not the core of their work. The core of their work, um, whatever themes or, or, or problems they're trying to solve through their work, they're not really media-based. Um, and uh, I think that uh, I have very few artists who make NFTs. The ones who do, um, they, they've been making NFTs for a long time. Uh, and they're still not convinced because they don't want to jump on the trend collecting bandwagon because that opens a whole other, whole other world of people, of, of collectors and clients that is essentially an unregulated space, um, at least where we're from. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's something that we're treading very carefully. Um, with regards to our clients, about them buying, buying or, 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 you know, um, looking online and making decisions online. I feel like our clients, they just, they, they realize with the pandemic that the online world is just another medium through which they can buy. You know, it's not, it's not like they're going around saying, oh, I'm, on, I'm an online buyer. No, it's just, it's become matter of fact. And this is actually, this is, whether we like it or not, uh, you know, how many times have we said, this is the last Zoom meeting I'm going to attend? But look at us. We're here. Um, and this is going to be the way moving forward. So this is just going to be another medium. Um, we have to claim it. Um, we have to work with it. Uh, I, I'm sure that Christiana, I mean, has a whole legal department trying to make sure that things don't, you know, Things, things, things are sort of controlled, um, but yeah, I, 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 we're sort of watching and uh, moving with it matter-of-factly, but being very cautious. Thank you. I should also just say, um, in response to that, that uh, there are definitely um, uh, certain depending on where you're operating, um, there are, are certain places that are more advanced in terms in terms of their governing um, of the space. Uh, I mean, Congress is, U.S. Congress has been <laughs> very, very um, hands on deck in terms of trying to implement um, laws. I mean, these, ha these things haven't been finalized, but we know that they're definitely um, coming along. And uh, it's our job as a gallery to make sure that we're um, uh, making sure that we're following those rules and also following that news. Um, so we want to take that work uh, and that pressure off of our artists so they can actually focus on their practice specifically. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, within um, other spaces as well, uh, Asia and uh, Europe as well, we'll, we'll definitely see um, uh, governances, making sure that they're putting in rules as well uh, in terms of Web3 and online specifically, how we're operating within the space, um, the legality of it. I'll let you, you always speak to this more, but um, yeah, things are definitely moving fast. We're trying to make sure that we're uh, on top of it. Yeah, and thanks for that, Christiana. Just to add to that, um, you know, in some ways, we always expect our artists to be in some way shamanic or visionary, right? Or at least, you know, I love to work with artists because they help me see the world potentially in a different way. And I love seeing art because it makes me think about world structures and institutional structures uh, in the way the, the world around us in a different way. But just because I expect our artists that I love to be shamanic, it doesn't mean that they are not within the political and social and cultural and legal structures in which all of our jurisdictions operate. And I think vis-a-vis -vis the world of Web3, 
Um, it, it's, it's not going to be just about copyright anymore. And of course, copyright is already a really um, outdated body of law because in some ways, the copyright jurisdictions across most countries got settled even before there was the internet. So the idea of copying, reproducing, adapting, disseminating, all of those new concepts that many of our artists currently utilize in their practice didn't really readily exist in terms of the technologies that copyright thought that it had to deal with. But interestingly enough, I think in the web three, we have other bodies of law that artists and gallerists that support artists will have to contend with. For example, even things like what is an NFT? What is the NFT going to be defined as legally? Is it just property? Or is it like more like a stock, like a security, right? Things like that. These are legal questions that I think not just artists and gallerists, but also lawyers too are watching the space as it is changing very quickly. Perhaps to Yoi or Christiana, you could speak more to the potentials on the flip side of um, these shifting um, infrastructures um, and potent potentials of blockchain when it, term when it comes to changing these um, rules and practices. Um, I think that, you know, I like to see um, NFTs and specifically um, creation on the blockchain as an extension of an artist's practice. And we're seeing our artists be able to actualize um, bodies of work that they never really were able to bring into fruition within a physical realm. Um, you know, just thinking back to our multimedia based artists like Lucas Samaras, um, whose work Quite frankly, uh, Lucas has never been 100% happy with a physical print. Um, he feels, he's always felt that his work needed to be um, displayed and viewed uh, within a digital realm to always have it be within its truest form. Um, so being able to offer this technology for to a lot of our artists has really been able to um, have our, or offered our artists a situation in which they can really, um, uh, expand beyond the bounds of what they prior, uh, priorly thought uh, uh, they were contained within, within like the physical realm. Um, and I'm really excited to see as Web3 pushes forward and um, there's more engagement within the metaverse, because I think that honestly, we're very, very um, early on within this space and NFTs is just the beginning. Um, uh, Pace Verso is more so a Web3 um, company. It's not only just uh, supporting NFTs. So I'm excited to see how, uh, as blockchain technology progresses, um, we ultimately will see how that in turn um, helps our artists practice grow as well. Um, and to back off of that, thank you, Christiana. Um, before I sort of like head into my like NF NFT zealotry, I also do want to acknowledge the point that Issa mentioned in terms of her artists working with digital technology and almost not wanting to jump onto that collective bandwagon. I think that feeling is very important for us to honor vis-a-vis -vis our artists because it really shouldn't be that just because there's this new technology, every artist should jump onto that trend. I definitely uh, don't think that's right. In some ways, the artists themselves should feel like that is just another tool that they can use to put forth their practice if they choose to do so. Now, that having been said, I think the wild frontier of NFTs is definitely a little bit frothy at the moment, and potentially maybe because there were so many collectors looking and learning and buying art online last year. So in that wild frontier of digital art and particularly in NFTs, again, from the Hiscox online art trade report in 2021, sales of NFTs were around 3.5 USD in the first three quarters of 2021. And I also wanted to point out that Art Review's annual most influential 
people in 2021 in that list and again it's just a list but in that list of people the smart contract that helps to automate these functions under nfts that was the standard interface so erc 721 that actually topped the chart um, from a legal perspective though what i'm seeing at the moment is that it's still very hard, I think, for buyers of NFTs to understand what they are getting and what they will get to do with that NFT. And so most of the time, what an NFT purchaser is getting is the certificate of authenticity that confirms that they own a digital asset, which confirms the uniqueness of that transaction. Right? Of course, that doesn't mean that there aren't copies of the digital asset already floating out there, some of which may be authenticated by other transactions. And further, the NFT purchaser may or may not have certain rights to that underlying digital asset. And I think to try to understand what those rights are, there are a couple of places to look including things like the terms of the marketplace where the NFT purchaser purchased the NFT, maybe project specific terms, and maybe appended additional words to the automatically executed contract. On the flip side, talking about blockchain, which is the underlying technology under which NFTs sit, I do want to mention that I think that technology has a lot of potential use possibilities potentially in the art world. And so if blockchain technology, if used for good, has the potential opportunity to bring transparency to transactions, it's potentially an opportunity to help sustain a place of record that gives information about artwork and that sounds very much like a way to maintain a record about provenance supporting artists and art history so for example i get to support start bond which is a, an art and tech company based in japan i've been involved in i've been supporting on the side they've been building an infrastructure that helps to do this it was established in 2014 which from a like a web universe timeline perspective is a long time ago and definitely way before the current NFT boom. And it's attempting to help art world stakeholders, including galleries, collectors, museums, and artists to keep track of artwork and artwork moves. And so I would say that the attention given to transacting digital art and to buying and selling NFTs and thinking about NFTs has in fact helped raise art world stakeholders awareness of these other possibilities of this kind of technology. Thank you. Um, I think this would be a good point to turn to an audience question that is related. Um, so this person is saying, I'm curious about the potential for disruption to both commerce and law that technology platforms present to the art industry. We've seen this already with advertising, publishing, and social media companies. Do art galleries need to see technology platforms like the ones that host NFTs as competition? Isa or Christiana? Um, I, I don't really, I don't think that um, technology platforms are competition. Uh, I think it's just one other thing, um, one other medium. And, and let's not forget in the history of art, I mean, yeah, drawing, sculpture, painting, the most recent ones, photography, which turned into digital media, which turned into NFTs, you know? So, so th this is, a, there's a whole history of art, um, art mediums, um, you know, and this is just the next one. Uh, 
I, I agree. I do see this as a resource, to be very honest. I don't see it as competition at all. Um, I see it as just another operative within the space that galleries honestly can utilize if they're very, very creative um, and open um, in terms of enriching an artist's practice. Let me actually be the devil's advocate here because I do agree with both Issa and Christiana, but let me ask the secondary question to this question is, you know, with the NFT marketplaces that are popping up, some artists have the ability to directly market to their own audiences and reach out to their own audiences and then potentially create new users and collectors of their work, which I, I personally think is awesome. And so I think for me, the, the secondary question to the two of you is, how do you then work in a positive way to bring those new users that may have come to learn about an artist through an NFT, how do you bring them into your communities and the gallery community? I think that um, that's something that we've really been experiencing with Pace Verso, uh, especially with having collectors more so convert um, in terms of having more familiarity with the crypto community um, and specifically NFT art or digital art, and then pivoting more so to the contemporary art world and, and getting involved with physical art artists um, or artists who make only physical work. Um, and I should say that there's a lot of trust uh, and also um, a lot of these collectors see um, a lot of benefit uh, in terms of working specifically with a gallerist that has a concerted fo focus um, and some form of, of uh, allegiance to an artist uh, in terms of supporting their practice, um, having an understanding of their market, um, having uh, an understanding and focus in terms of providing uh, support to institutional um, uh, uh, focus and, and support that are coming from uh, curators. I think that a lot of collectors see a lot of value in that and a lot of artists also see a lot of value in that um, in terms of what a gallery can provide. So while um, there's a lot of uh, democratization in terms of artists being able to, you know, go directly to the, uh, the source and sell their work, I do do you think that there are a lot of artists that understand the fact that having a gallerist or a gallery within their corner who supports them and has their best interest in heart, <laughs> and also from an archiving perspective, because the blockchain can only do so much, um, I think that they understand that gallerists can't be completely omitted from uh, the, the situation. Yeah, to answer to that, um... The relationship between the artist and the gallerist is something that we've, um, my partner Rachel and I, something that we've grown and nurtured and taken care of, and it goes both ways. And I think that um, our artists are, prim are first and foremost artists. They're not, um, you know, they, they have studios. Um, they all started out making things, you know, making objects. Um, and this is very different from this breed of NFT creators. Um, I'm, I'm talking about like, you know, that this, this like mass hysteria of NFT. Um, I don't, I don't, I really don't, uh, it's a totally different animal from what we do. Um, from our artists. Uh, maybe we're more traditional, maybe we're slower, um, but we're also, this is a long game thing for us. Again, we are not into our art, you know, we will support our artists to make NFTs if it's part of their practice. Um, not because they want to make NFTs and they want to make money and they want to sell directly to people. I mean, to, to, to clients. That's it. I have another audience question um, for Issa, picking up on kind of where you left off. Um, do you know if there is a reluctance towards making digital art and especially NFTs in other countries in Asia or Southeast Asia? And for Christiana, can you share the demographics of the buyers of pieces NFTs? 
are they coming from buyers in Asia, like they are for your works and offer in Seoul or Hong Kong? This is Elaine of Elaine. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Elaine. Um, good question. Uh, I can only speak um, my personal experience of this, of, uh, to answer your question. I cannot tell you how many uh, people who I don't know have come knocking on my email, uh, sending me messages, asking if they can have an NFT show in my gallery. Um, and when I ask who the artists are, it's like people who all are hiding behind their, their handles, you know? Um, and then when I ask, you know, what if my artist wants, do you want to show one of my artists in case they do NFTs? They're like, well, uh, what does your artist do? And it's funny because it's like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the one to ask you that, right? So, um, I know that on the, on the, I guess on the client side or on the, all these people who are trying to, I guess, uh, ride the wave, they're all super gung ho about it, but all the galleries that I know, 90% of the galleries that I know, um, they're very wary, but they do, they're super excited about blockchain and the ability of blockchain to um uh what is the word to authenticate you know a digital authentication by blockchain for exactly what yayoi said for authenticity for for transparency to protect the artist protect the gallery protect the artwork um to answer uh the second part of that question also hello elaine um, regarding the demographic of NFT buyers, uh, we definitely have a very, very diverse um, demographic of people who are engaging with the platform and also acquiring work. Um, one of uh, two of actually our best uh, collectors in terms of um, the NFT projects that we've put out have actually been collectors based in Asia. Um, one who is actually from Singapore um so most definitely there's a lot of collectors uh, specifically within those regions a lot of our, a huge part of our asia team is very very excited um about our engagement um within uh uh, uh the nft space because so many of their collectors um have some form of uh knowledge or understanding of crypto or specifically have some investment as well um, and want to be able to support uh, our artists who are venturing forward into that territory. Um, but we also, of course, have a lot of collectors who are US based. We have collectors that are from Europe as well. Um, it spans both collectors that are more so coming from crypto, but then also collectors that are more traditional buyers and moving within the space. So it's quite interesting to see how um, our artists who are now engaging within um, uh, this space have been able to really create uh, this cross pollinization um, that we wouldn't be able to typically experience um, in the more traditional sense or in a more traditional market, I should say. One of the things that I think will be quite interesting going forward as many more collectors try to collect digital art and, and this is actually, I think, an age-old problem that has been the case for digital art in general. But it's like, how do collectors decide to lend to museums, lend digital art to show digital art in museums? Or for example, if somebody comes pitching on Issa's door to say, hey, we wanna show NFTs, you know, what does that actually mean? And I, and I think, sometimes based upon sort of the legal rights that the user currently has, they may or may not actually be able to do that. And there might have to be creative ways in which to show this artwork. And it can be anything as simple as just essentially providing a high res image, like a JPEG, right? That's then projected onto the wall. It could be as simple as that. Or it could be, for example, that the NFT is transferred 
from the wallet of the collector to the wallet of the museum. So then there's like the stewardship arrangement that has to happen. It'll be very interesting for me. That's a space that I think some museums are starting to think about it, traditional legacy museums. There are now new museums of NFTs that are popping up, right? some of which have been developed by the collectors of this new form of digital art. But that's a space that for me has been specifically interesting to look out for. I want to use this as an opportunity to also uh, address uh, the question from Ben specifically um, in terms of can you exhibit an NFT either printed on a wall or in a museum? Um, we've actually already started to run into this, just piggybacking off of what you <laughs> was talking about. Um, actually, the collector of uh, the NFT that we sold uh, during uh, Basel, Miami, that was made by Drift, um, is loaning uh, the NFT and the physical um, uh, artwork to an institution in Amsterdam. Um, and I should say that that, that uh, specific loan is a bit easier because the artists and the collector are more so working directly together. They're in direct contact. Um, it does get a little stickier <laughs> in situations in which collectors may be a bit more removed from the situation. But I think that um, a lot of institutions are, as you just said, starting to really get involved within the space and trying to figure out how to start building collections or curating um, uh, exhibitions uh, with NFT works. Um, the Hermitage Museum in Russia just had a major NFT exhibition, um, which was solely an online exhibition. Um, I understand that ICA Miami has started collecting NFT artworks. Um, the Hammer is also starting to collect NFT artworks. Um, so it's quite crazy to see how this space um, is really influencing um, a lot of more traditional stakeholders within the art world to start advancing outside of uh, their comfort zone. But uh, to speak to this question, it most definitely is possible. I think um, it, it kind of depends on uh, the parameters in, in terms of the smart contract, um, how directly, uh, if the, the collector is working specifically with the artist or the artist is aware of the exhibition, um, there's a lot of factors to take into consideration within those terms. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Christiana, for that. Um, and and I, I will say that, you know, we keep saying that these automatically executed contracts are smart. Like we keep saying that they're smart contracts, but I think in some ways they're as only as smart as the people that are using them. And so for me, what I've also been seeing, right? And Christiana, thanks for sharing that example of that collector with Drift and how they are directly working with Drift on a presentation. I think that kind of communication surrounding the collecting and stewarding of this digital art is important too, because there might still have to be additional documentation like licenses or an email exchange that talks about how the technology will be lent and projected. All of that I think still is um, not quite as automatic as I think some crypto people hope. Well, thank you everyone for your expansive ideas and notes about the potentials of where NFTs can go and where digital platforms can go and how we might um, encounter artworks in the digital realm. Yes, Isa? Yeah, I have a question for you, Yoy. Is it okay? Yeah, 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 go ahead. Could could you let could you could you type in the the chat box the name of the Japanese company doing the blockchain? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, so thank you everyone so much for your ideas, for being on this panel. Um, Camilla, would you like to jump back in to close the session? Yes, thank you so much, Isa, Yayo and Christiana, just for sharing your expertise and insights to help us navigate through this incredibly fast developing side to the art market. It's been really interesting to hear you this evening and to Chloe as well for moderating such a fascinating topic. Thank you. So on behalf of C Focus, thank you to everyone for joining us. There is one more talk um, tomorrow, which Art Asia Pacific, it will be hosted by Elaine. It's called Evolving Collections at um, 7 p.m. Singapore time. So for anyone who would like to join us, please do.
But for this evening, thank you so much and have a great rest of your days wherever you are. Many thanks.